Good morning. Thanks everyone for attending. It's great to see so many people around here and so many people excited about Spark. So last year has not been only a great year for Spark, but also for Databricks. And we are very proud that Databricks has and continues to be a driver behind the adoption of Apache Spark. To help with this adoption, last year we have launched two certification programs, one for applications and one for Spark distributions. These two certification programs aim to make sure that any certified application will run on any certified distribution. By doing so, we fuel the growth of the Spark ecosystem and we reduce the risk of fragmentation. These two programs have been, are free and have been quite successful. So far, we have certified more than 35 applications and more than 11 Spark distributions. Furthermore, since the last Spark Summit last year, the number of certified applications more than tripled and the number of certified distributions more than doubled. We have been training Spark developers and data scientists in 2011 when Spark was still a research project at UC Berkeley. Since starting Databricks Cloud, we dramatically increased our efforts on training. Last year, we trained around 2,000 people. And this year, in the first three months alone, we are planning to, tra to train over 1,200 people. Out of those, 500 will be trained here at this Spark Summit. This is the largest number of people we ever train at a single event. Also, over the next couple of months, we are going to offer two massive open online courses. First, introduction to big data with Apache Spark, which will be taught by Anthony Joseph, a faculty at UC Berkeley. Second, scalable machine learning, which will be taught by Amit Tawalkar, now a faculty at UCLA. So together, we are, so far, more than 46,000 people have registered for these courses. This number is much higher than in our wildest expectations. Now, let me talk about Databricks product. The, the vision at Databricks, our vision at Databricks is to make big data simple. And as a first step to, as a first step to fulfill that vision, at the last Spark Summit, we unveiled Databricks Cloud. After unveiling, we are overwhelmed by the response of the users. Over 3,500 users have registered since then to use Databricks Cloud. Then at the end of the last year, more precisely November 2014, we have launched Databricks Cloud under limited availability, and we started to slowly grow the customer's base. Today, I am very happy to announce that more than 100 companies have been using Databricks Cloud. During this time, we gathered a better understanding about how our customers use Databricks Cloud and what value we provide to them. In the remaining of this talk, I am going to provide some illustration of this value and of the feature which enables this value. But first, let me talk a bit about the problem we are solving. Today, doing a big data project, like many of you know, is hard. And one consequence of that is, is that they take a long time. This might have a high opportunity cost, and in many cases may lead to the failure of the project. So why do these projects take so long? Well, because they are complex. If you think about, if you start a data project, first you need to set up and maintain a cluster probably a, data, uh, uh, a Hadoop cluster. And today, this takes between six and nine months alone. 
Once you have a cluster, you need to ingest data, you need to prepare data. And data comes from multiple sources, it's unstructured and noisy. So to ingest the data, to clean the data, and then to transform the data is typically a long and time-consuming process. And once you develop some scripts to do so, you want to put these scripts in production so that you can apply the same processing for the new data which come in the system. This again requires to productize your scripts, which may take weeks to months. Once you have the data, next you are going to try to do some exploration. Typically to compute some KPIs or other metrics of interest. And once you have these metrics, what do you do next? Well, you want to present these metrics to your management or to your business organizations as reports or dashboards. This again is a long and iterative process, which may take weeks. And to create reports or dashboards, you can either one of the existing BI tools, or in many cases, you are going to build your own reporting or dashboard tools. This might take again between weeks and months. But really, the main reason you get your, this data is to get insights, which will help to improve your product, service, or business process. This requires you to leverage machine learning, uh, graph processing, or other statistic tools to get these insights. Again, this is an iterate, iterative process, which is quite time consuming. And once you get insights, what do you do with them? You want to productize them again, right? To build data products like recommendation systems. And again, this takes, can take a long time, from weeks to months. So when all is said and done, what you are looking at a timeline which takes many months, even years. The promise of Databricks Cloud is to significantly reduce the time to results from months to weeks or even days. Databricks is doing so by building a platform which provides zero management, real time, and unif unified capabilities found today in many tools. In addition, Databricks Cloud is an open platform which brings additional benefits to the customer. Databricks Cloud is a hosted platform which today run in AWS. On top of that, Databricks Cloud provides a sophisticated cluster manager for Spark. And on top of that, a workspace which consists of several applications and tools, including notebooks, dashboard, and jobs, which significantly speed up and simplify data processing. So now, let me know about, let me, let me take, take let me, let me talk about capabilities which enables Databricks Cloud to significantly reduce the time to results. First, zero management. Databricks Cloud provides a powerful set of capabilities for cluster management, which allows you effectively create and destroy clusters in seconds, dynamically scale them up and down, and effectively allow users to share the clusters. By doing so, Databricks Cloud obviates the need to set up and maintain clusters. Databricks Cloud provides also real-time capabilities, and this comes in several dimensions. First, Spark itself, as you know, provides the ability to provide interactive query processing and to process stream data in real time. This enables users to make decisions in real time, which significantly improves their productivity when it comes to exploration, insights, and even data preparation. Notebooks. So notebooks are the central component of the workspace. And their capabilities far surpasses the capabilities of existing notebooks. For, for, for example, 
Databricks notebooks provide interactive visualization. Users can visualize the results at a click of a button, and this again help improve their productivity when doing interactive data preparation, exploration, and getting insights. Also, notebooks, Databricks notebooks provide real-time collaboration very similar with Google Docs. This allows users to share documents and code to work more effectively and to use each other work, to reuse each other work. Offline and online collaboration thus help the user to perform much more time efficiently analysis, exploration, and insights. But perhaps more importantly, Databricks Cloud provides a unified platform. And first, as you know, Spark provides one API, one engine, which can seamlessly support all workloads, including batch, streaming, interactive queries, and complex processing, such as machine learning and graph-based computations. This obviates the need to use multiple systems and multiple execution engines, which again significantly increase your productivity when building the big data pipeline and when moving what you've built into production. Similarly, the workspace provides a set, one set of tools, notebooks, dashboard, and jobs, which can be used everywhere for ingestions, ETL, explorations, insights, as well as running jobs in production. This again obviates a need for using a disjoint set of tools and accelerate every stage in the pipeline. In addition, all these tools are tightly integrated. And to illustrate the benefits of that, let me consider two examples. We all know that notebooks are great for interactive analysis, exploration, getting insights. But what do you do after you are done with this? Well, if you are a data scientist, you are going to hands off your code, maybe your model, to a team of engineers who are going to implement, who is going to re-implement your functionality, test it debug it, and so forth, and then deploy it in production at scale. Wouldn't it be great if we can eliminate that step? Well, Databricks Cloud allows you to do exactly that. Once you developed a notebook, you can run it in as a job. Jobs take input arguments, so you can run the same job on a different data set with different configuration parameters and different inputs. Also, you can use a job to write complex workflows, which call other notebooks and other arbitrary Spark jobs. By doing so, Databricks Cloud allows you to do all your development, testing, and debugging in notebooks, and then deploy it in production at a click of a button. This significantly increases the speed to take your work and run in production. Also, notebooks are not only integrated with jobs, they are also integrated with dashboards. Once you come up with a cool set of plots which shows the metrics of interest, you can take these plots, drag and drop them, and create dashboards. And then you can publish this dashboard. So Databricks Cloud allows you to create dashboards in minutes and publish them at a the click of a button. So this way, Databricks Cloud reduces the length of the data pipeline, of building a data pipeline, of completing a data project from many months to weeks or even days. Furthermore, Databricks provide an open platform. In particular, with Databricks Cloud, you can import and export data from a variety of storages, systems like S3, Cassandra, HDFS, uh, Kinesis, just to name a few. 
It allows you to upload libraries and arbitrary Spark jobs and run them programmatically. Through an ODBC driver, it allows you to run your favorite BI tools, such as Tableau, Click, MicroStrategy, or Zoom Data, and also allows you to download, if you wish, your code you developed in Databricks Cloud, and you can run on any uh, certified Spark distribution. So there is no lock-in. So now, instead of having me talking even more about how great Databricks Cloud is, I think it will be more interesting and useful for you guys to hear from our customers. So next, I'd like to invite on the scene Chu Li, who is head of data engineering and sciences at MindV Fitness Pal, now part of Under Armour, sitting at the intersection between health, nut nut nutrition, in a digital world, my fitness pal, it's a unique position to translate their wealth and richness of their data set into insights for their gro growing customer base. Please welcome Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Ian. So this is my great honor and pleasure to be part of uh, Ian's uh, keynote presentation. So I'm here today to share with you some of our experience of using Spark in the context of handling and processing health and, health and fitness data that we have accumulated in the course of many years. So let me start with the quick intro of my, my fitness pal. So what's a my fitness pal? So my fitness pal is a simple and effective health and fitness tracking tool. So using our app, our users will be empowered to set up their fitness and health course uh, using some kind of tracking mechanism. So we're number one health and fitness app for both iOS and Android. Our users number app. So we have one million five-star ratings in different like app stores. So that's well affected. In, also in terms of uh, the big number of user community that we have built over many, many years. So we have over 80 million registered users so far. So our app is not a simple app because a new way or new angle of looking at the app is, is we are, our app is some sort of a knowledge base of food items. So what does it mean? So in the course of many years, we have accumulated over 5 million food items and 36 million recipes. So using that massive DB of food, our users have accumulated over 14.5 billion food entries. So that's a really huge you know, knowledge base of food items. As of last week, we also got acquired by Under Armour. So now, thanks to that, we have access to a massive DB of exercise data. So in other words, we have a lot of, lot of data. So why big data is important? Because we as an app, we're highly, highly interested in developing or creating a lot of value for our customers using our data. So in order to make that happen, I think there are mainly four factors that you have to consider into account. Number one, data. Obviously, in order to develop data product, you need to have data. Number two, you need to have a solid and highly scalable infrastructure. So in other words, you need to have the proper tooling in place to process your data. Number three, you need to have the right product fit. Why? Because you want to build product that customers care. Number four, you need to have access to some kind of data mining or machine learning approaches, which can automate your process and scale your approach. So we started looking into various solutions in the market. And we did quite a bit of study of different solutions in the market. And we came to the conclusion that Databricks plus Spark could be a one venue that we could explore. So that's what we decided to do starting a year ago. So as I said before, so we didn't have a problem of data, right? Because we had a pretty large database of food items. So we didn't have to worry about it. But the, the rest of the requisites, prerequisites to build data innovation 
we have challenges. So data book solution help us to make that happen. So data book solution provided a flexible and scalable data infrastructure to allow us a rapid and solid development of data products. So, so data books was fast, scalable, and stable. So we didn't have to worry about the whole complexity of developing tools to deal with large, large scale data. So it was very simple. At the same time, data bricks help us to reduce time to value. So what does it mean? So if you're a data scientist or data engineer, you have to spend many times um, quite a bit of effort on developing custom tools to process the data. That's really, really painful. So you don't want to do that. What you want is you want to have a tool ready and you want to develop your data product very quickly. So data breaks provided that solution. So instead of refocusing on developing customized tools, we could focus on the core aspect of developing data product. So that was really awesome. Also, DataBricks guys, as the first inventors of Spark, provide us quite a bit of helpful and insightful guidelines, and resources, and constant support to develop a very advanced machine learning uh, approaches. For instance, using MLLeap, we're able to develop a very sophisticated and advanced machine algorithms which empower our data product. So to conclude my part of the talk, I'd like to share with you a list of some sample projects that we worked in the past using Spark. The first project was food data cleaning, which was all about creating some kind of data pipeline to clean up our database. And this work is going to be presented later in the afternoon as part of the, one of the technical sessions. The other project that we, in which we used Spark was search. Search is a problem, right? because finding relevant content is a critical and crucial problem of every data science. So we apply Spark to improve the relevance of our search engine. The third project in which we applied Spark was a project that we called Suggested Serving Sizes. So this, is, this project was all about data transformation. So we had massive database of foods and we wanted to transform those foods in a different format. Why? Because we have a lot of international users. So we had to transform data using Spark, and for that project, Spark was extremely helpful and successful. So right now, we're in the middle of expanding our program of using Spark for other projects. For instance, we're planning to use Spark for ad targeting. Again, why that's necessary? Because when you build your ad targeting pipeline, you want to process a lot of data, you want to transform a lot of data, and you want to create a kind, kind of a personalized view of your data. For that purpose, Spark would be awesome. We're also building a recognition system using Spark, in particular, MLLeaf. Also, we are really doing a deep dive into customer understanding of our data. This is becoming more important than ever because now we, as a product Under Armour, we have more data including retail data, exercise data, food data, nutrition data, and all kinds of different kinds of data. So understanding our users is extremely important, extremely um, insight for us. So we want to use Spark for that purpose. Finally, we are in the middle of replacing our existing ETL process using Spark. We have already in place some kind of ETL process using Python but right now, we're in the middle of migrating that pipeline to Spark because of the low benefits that Spark can bring us to the table. So this is my end, end of my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. So next, I'd like to invite Rob Ferguson, who is the Director of Data uh, of uh, Engineering at Automatics Lab which promised to bring the internet of things like analytics to automotive industry. Please welcome, Rob. When you think internet of things, you're probably thinking about 
something for your smart home. Like, wouldn't it be great to save some money on my heating bill or unlock my doors automatically? My scale has its own Twitter account. But there are a lot of other things that are worthy as being part of the Internet of Things. Think flood buoys for public safety or red light cameras. Gradually, we're even increasing things to include full-blown computers, like the really expensive computer that's parked in your driveway right now, your car. Hi, I'm Rob Ferguson. I'm director of engineering at Automatic, and I want to connect your car to the internet. Is that working? OK, there we go. <laughs> we create a device that plugs into the same port that your mechanic uses to service your car. It wirelessly tethers to your phone using Bluetooth. And we use this information to help you drive smarter by saving money on your gas or tell you where you parked your car. Also, to help you drive safer by notifying emergency services if you're in a crash or decoding your check engine light for you. And yes, will connect you to other things. If you'd like to visit our store, you can get 20% off today by putting in spark plugs. Shameless plugging all aside. <laughs> there is a lot of data in your car. Everything from the amount of air rushing through your engine to its temperature. At Automatic, we always had big plans for this data. And we would surface those in our application, but we knew that as we were gathering all these readings, that they might produce future data products and other insights. So immediately, we sort of had two kinds of data. We had our organized application data, and we had this noisy time series of readings from your car. Actually, we had a lot more data than what's pictured. And like a lot of startups, we didn't necessarily know what to do with it. And so we dumped it into Redshift. And by the way, that noisy time series was a terabyte scale virtually instantly. This was about the time that I actually joined the company. And developers were finding that Redshift was the place that good data went to die. <laughs> They were afraid of touching our source of truth. They didn't really understand what the lack of primary keys meant. And even where Redshift was, would excel, the truth is that they were directly querying production to get the values that they wanted. If you're the new data guy, this is incredibly scary. So we had to move fast. And I had to use the things that they knew to get our data stable to scale. So Amazon databases are great. We dumped all the data into CSV, threw it into Spark. We took all of our Postgres data, threw it into a nightly Jenkins job, and once again, directly into S3. We could then go fix all these renegade devices and broken firmwares by deduping data in Spark and using various functions to clean it up. This is actually a really basic query. What's cool about it is that it comes from a slide deck from our biz dev guy who just jumped into a Databricks notebook. Have you ever wondered if the sticker value for your MPG on your car is right? I mean, it could be. But there's a good chance that it isn't. The engineer who figured this out he was our intern, and he had to do a complicated join over millions of miles of data to come up with that slide. The truth is, our engineers were familiar with IPython notebooks from various meetups that they went to. They created this collaborative data democracy where anyone in the company could go make valuable insights without having to understand the complicated aspects of programmatically accessing their data or uh, details like the operations of the database. The tools are what made the difference 
because engineering time was the most expensive thing that we had, not our data stores. So with great tools, I wonder what's hidden in your data. This map, by the way, doesn't have any roads on it. And if you'd like to hear about it, I'd love to tell you about it at 1 o'clock. Thanks. So our vision at Databricks is to eventually open our platform for third-party applications. We want to let enterprises consume and interact the data using the interface they are most familiar with, without the need to stitch together the best of breed tools. With Databricks Cloud, you will be able to upload the data and do all the necessary processing in Databricks Cloud, and then at the click of a button, launch your favorite application. All the configuration, creating the necessary infrastructure will be taken care of by Databricks Cloud transparently. To demonstrate this capability, I'd like to invite two of our closest partners. First, I'd like to invite Justin Langset, the CEO of the Zoom Data, which will demonstrate an analytics visualization and exploration tool built for big data from the ground up. Please welcome Justin. Thanks, Jan. So I'm Justin, CEO of Zoom Data. Uh, Zoom Data, if we could go to the uh, demo screen here in the back, guys. Thank you. So Zoom Data is a next generation business intelligence tool. We're trying to make reporting and dashboarding super easy for normal business people. Not you guys, but the actual normal business people that uh, need to benefit from all the great data that you guys are helping to prepare. So uh, it's been great to see the BI community really in, uh, embrace Spark SQL and start to use it. But what most BI tools do is they run Spark SQL and then they pull the results into a proprietary BI server, often Windows-based, and then they do reporting, slicing, dicing, uh, pivoting, things like that, kind of in that proprietary server. At Zoom Data, we don't do that. We instead leverage Spark directly to do all these operations. So that makes us very, very scalable and very, very fast. It also means that we depend on Spark. So like human beings depend on air, Zoom Data actually depends on Spark to operate which makes partnering with Databricks a very important thing for us to do. Uh, so in partnering with Databricks, they talked about this new application section available in the Databricks cloud, and we knew it would be very important to be embedded inside that Databricks application section. So I'm going to give you a demo now of how that actually works. Zoom data embedded inside, running inside the Databricks cloud, natively hooking up to data that's in the Databricks cloud. So I have a uh, Databricks notebook here. And in the Databricks notebook, I have a variety of tables. One of these tables has some retail point of sales transaction data. Uh, this is actually a billion rows of data, so it's not a small data set by any uh, stretch of the imagination. And I can show you that here if I go into this uh, notebook. I can just run a click uh, select star and count star. And so we see the data, and we also see the one billion some odd rows of data. So a lot of data sitting here in Databricks, uh, Databricks Cloud. So in notebooks, I can do interactive analysis, kind of more for a uh, more technical kind of analyst. But what we have now here is this application section. And inside here, we have Zoom Data set up. So just by clicking on Zoom Data, I launch into the Zoom Data interface. And here inside Zoom Data, running, running inside the Databricks Cloud, we have access to all those tables that were present in the Databricks Cloud account. So I have this uh, different sales data and other uh, data automatically just sitting here, and I can see the types of visuals that I could immediately launch into through Zoom data. So I'm going to launch into that billion rows of data and just bring it up initially in a pivot table. And here's the results. You can see at the bottom the one billion rows. And since this is a pivot table, let's go ahead and pivot. And thanks to the power of Spark and the speed of Spark and Zoom data, the way it runs on top of it, I can perform these pivot operations on top of the billion rows nearly instantaneously. I can also drill down. So if I see some values here I'm interested in, I could zoom in and break this out by zip code. And again, literally within a few seconds, I get the results. And this is uh, very, very fast for a billion rows of data. And doing it this quickly is just uh, very, very great because as humans, they have kind of three second attention spans. And if you don't give them results in three seconds, they get bored and go do something else. 
So now that I have this result, I can go and change the different types of visualizations, or I could quickly build up a dashboard by taking data from the same source or a different source and start to lay out a dashboard. Now, once I've laid out a dashboard, I might want to give access to this to lots and lots of end users. Maybe hundreds or thousands of users in my organization might want to access this, uh, this dashboard. And so that's where Zoom data comes in to really make that scalable and make that secure. So we're using uh, LDAP and single sign-on and things like that and row-level security. We can really lock down this data, but also make it super easy for users to see and interact with data, even at these very large scales. So here's a dashboard running on the same billion rows in Databricks Cloud. I can see a uh, scatter plot. If I want to change any of the values, I can just click and touch on anything I'm interested in. And say I want to filter all the rest of the visuals by California. And again, nearly instantaneously, uh, all the rest of the visuals have upgraded, updated. So very, very, very fast interactive analysis of huge amounts of data um, powered by the underlying technology. If my data is not yet in Databricks Cloud, Zoom Data's connectors to the Amazon stack, to Elasticsearch, to Solar, to SQL and Hadoop engines, uh, and to legacy data uh, warehouse technology as well to help bring that, all that data together. And Zoom Data also supports uh, real-time data. So I'll just show you one last thing here. And this is a real-time dashboard. And it's the same sales transaction data, but it's streaming in real time. So I can zoom into the current hour here, 9 AM. I can actually watch these uh, sales transactions as they're streaming in. Or I can go and look at uh, the data live here. So this is live data for the rolling hour. And I can watch it live, or I can rewind to historical data, and then fast forward uh, back through the history, and eventually just snap back to the live data stream. So we call this a data DVR. So that's a little bit about uh, Zoom data. Uh, Zoom data's integration of the Databricks Cloud is available in beta uh, today. If you're interested, you can go to this URL or contact Zoom data or Databricks or stop by our booth here at the conference. Thank you. So next, I'd like to welcome Rob Harper, who is a lead product architect at Uncharted, for to, formerly known as Oculus Inform, Information. And Rob will demo Pantera, a tool which uses Spark to provide Google Maps-like interface to explore the richness of the large, the big, the large data sets. Please welcome Rob. Thanks very much, Jan. Good morning, everyone. We created Pantera based on the fundamental guiding principles that visualization, interactive exploration, and preservation of detail are critical to understanding your data. Pantera is a tool that's designed to plot millions or billions of records and uses the power of human visual perception to ident help identify patterns, patterns that might otherwise be lost in summary visualization. We're really excited to be making uh, Pantera part of the Databricks app ecosystem. Uh, Databricks allows our users to focus on their analysis instead of their cluster infrastructure, and it allows us to focus on creating user-friendly and compelling applications that use the speed and power of Spark, but also can scale with our users and their data. So I'm, without further ado, I'm going to get right into a demonstration of Pantera. I can launch the tool directly from the Databricks, uh, the Databricks cloud. And Pantera integrates directly into the, uh, the Databricks extension API, which means that I can select any available uh, provision cluster from the Databricks cloud, as well as plot any of the tables. Uh, like Justin showed you earlier, lots of tables loaded into Databricks, and I can plot any one of them, including temporary tables that could be registered from in-process Databricks notebook analyses. So I can have a nice, tight feedback integration loop. Today, I'll be looking at a rich data set of uh, taxi trips from New York City. So I launch the tool, and I can see New York on the map here on the, uh, on the left. And I'll start my analysis by creating a layer of pickups. So we'll look at the locations that taxis are picking people up in the, uh, in the city. So I can choose from my available columns, my pickup longitude and latitude for x and y. And I'll be plotting the count of records at each location. Create my layer. And now what we've done is automatically submitted a job to the Spark cluster. And this job is generating our current view. We can see that the, uh, the currently running jobs down in the bottom. And we can start to see data coming in right now. By generating these views on demand, we uh, allow quick feedback and easy exploration of our data, sort of free form exploration. Now that the data is available, I can see that we have a really high density of taxicab pickups in Manhattan, and noticeably less so in the other boroughs. 
I can see, as expected, that the data aligns quite closely with the city streets. However, I do see here and down here that I do have a, a higher than normal degree of GPS error in and around the tall buildings of downtown and midtown. I can change my uh, visualization settings to better suit my analysis, and then I add another layer here in blue showing the drop-off locations. I'll dial down the map so you can see it a little bit better on the projector. So what we see immediately, now that we have pickups in red and drop-offs in blue, is that taxi cabs are not picking people up everywhere they're dropping them off, particularly in the boroughs. So now let's zoom in from this high-level overview down to the city block level to take a closer look. I use standard web map zoom pan paradigms to explore my data. And being able to drill down to any level of detail, whether it's all the way up to the world or right down to the city block, Pantera's allow me to explore patterns that, that exist potentially across all scales. So again, we're generating views on demand here. We can see a couple of tiles still loading. And now they're done. So in, at this view, at the city block view, we can see that while the pickups, or sorry, the drop-offs are relatively ubiquitous, the pickups are really only occurring on some roads. And under closer investigation, we see these are the roads that are actually headed towards Manhattan. In fact, on this two-way street here through the middle, we can see that the pickups are occurring specifically on the side of the street, which is Manhattan bound. Pantera allows me to see and preserve nuances like this that would otherwise be lost in summary visualizations. But I can plot a lot more than just the location records or the location columns that I've shown so far. And I can plot more than just record count as well. In fact, I can plot any dimensions of my data. For example, the average tip percentage by location distance or speed, or even non-geographic plots. This isn't just for maps. So if you'd like to see some more examples of uh, a Pantera in action, including social media data, as well as non-geographic examples like looking at Bitcoin transactions, or if you're interested in how we use Spark to make this really responsive and quickly generating views on demand, please join us this afternoon. We're speaking in the application track at 2 p.m. and hope to see you there. Thanks very much. So there are many other applications, but unfortunately, we don't have time to demo today. However, I like to mention Tresata. So please go to their talk. They are going to demo a revolutionary anti-money money laundry application integrated with Databricks Cloud. So in summary, Databricks Cloud can dramatically accelerate time to results for big data. Furthermore, Databricks Cloud is an open platform, allow you to import and export data from a variety of sources, allows you to run arbitrary Spark jobs, allows you to use and, and to download your code if you wish to run it on a certified Spark distributions. And finally, it will allow you to run at the click of a button your favorite application. One final thing, at Databricks, Cloud, we are working very hard to give you access to the service as soon as possible. And we know that many of you have waited for months, and we really appreciate your patience. So as a token of our appreciation for your patience, I am very happy to announce that everyone here, everyone who has registered for the Spark Summit East, will get access to Databricks Cloud. You'll get an email over the next week in which you are going to get an access to your own deployment on Databricks Cloud. Hope you'll enjoy it and you don't disappoint it. Thank you and I wish you a great Spark Summit.